Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. And today's guest is someone that uh, needs no introduction, but it's our, our friend, Dr. Don Rucker. He's chief strategy officer at OneUp Health. Welcome, Don. Yeah, hey, thanks, John. Good to have you back on the program. You know, everyone always loves to hear your insights and perspectives. And we got some juicy uh, regulations to talk about today. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> For, juicy for health IT policy nerds. Is, is that a health IT uh, Valentine? Is that what, what's the? <laughs> yeah, you know, when I started, maybe as a sort of a pre market guy, uh, I never thought I would be this involved in regulation. But, um, you know, hey, life throws you different, <laughs> different pitches. Yeah, for sure. Well, before we dive into the regulations, tell us a little bit about yourself and One Up Health. Yeah, so as uh, folks may know, um, I'm actually still a practicing ER doc, um, have been interested in IT. Um, unlike most docs, after doing a residency, internal medicine residency, as it were, um, I went and did an undergraduate computer science degree. Um, oh. So maybe I should have done the computer science first, but back in those <laughs> days, there wasn't much to say there in computer science. Mm -hmm. um, Though one of my college classmates actually did do pretty well in computer science, a guy named Bill Gates, whom I never met, yeah, <laughs> ironically he, enough. He did all right with her himself, I'd say. At any rate. <laughs> um, so been heavily involved in, in information technology and EMRs and designing EMRs. And obviously at ONC, um, we had the opportunity to put the uh, 21st Century Cures Act in, which the rules we're going to talk about today are really either directly from the Cures Act or a direct outgrowth of the Cures Act and really the desire of Congress and the public to have transparency and the ability to control our health care. So, um, you know, but lots, lots of stuff to follow there. Um, I'm the chief strategy officer at a uh, venture funded company called One Up Health. Um, we just raised a C round, so, you know, 150 employees, so it's not quite the garage type of operation. Um, <laughs> and the 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 goal and the premise of um, One Up Health, we have about 75 payer customers and a whole bunch of digital app customers, is really to think about and to facilitate modern combinations of clinical and cloud computing, right? I mean, the real opportunity of these modern data stacks, most notably Fire, which is all over the rule, um, is to you know make us smarter in computing and healthcare. And so, by taking Fire data and having it cloud enabled, you you put into one spot the APIs, the data, the computation, rather than having to go back into you know a legacy claims processing engine or a legacy EDW or a legacy EHR. So anyway, that's the day job. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'm obviously still uh, have my fingers in various public policy <laughs> activities. Sure. Let's leave it at that. Well, I mean, if you don't know, use FIRE, then, you know, you aren't going to be able to use those computer science COBOL skills, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Some yeah. of the systems are... are you know, I was, I was uh, back in my era, it was stuff like Pascal and which is Pascal sort of not there too. anymore and Lisp. And um, we did have a teeny bit of old, old at the time languages, but there's always new stuff. For sure. Well, my first computer science class was Pascal as well, so I'm with you. But uh, yeah, tell us, what do, what do people need to know about the latest interoperability and prior auth rule? What, what you know, for those that aren't as steeped in it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. things they shouldn't understand about it? I think, um, so one background comment, um, especially in Medicare Advantage, which is now the largest Medicare program, um, in, there's just been a cry for accountability and prior prior auth which is what the rule really deals with you know it's interoperability um with a heavy dose of prior auth right, right? so prior auth is the entree um it's the appetizer and it's the dessert in this rule um though there are some api interoperability things it really comes out of just a desire 
for accountability and transparency. I saw something um, today in one of the trades that um, there are now 20 states that have prior authorization laws, right? Wow. Which is pretty stunning when you think about it because that should sort of be a federal thing, right? When you think about it, right? Because yeah. the payment the programs <laughs> and the, the, you know, the most of the policy on healthcare payments, all federal, whether it's the CMS programs or the tax code um, or the VA or CDC or the Indian Health Service, right? Or the DOD. I'm a Red Cross volunteer at a local um, army hospital. So um, it's it's all really federal. So that people are so unhappy that states would feel they need to do stuff gives you a sense of the temperature here. The rule, CMS is really responding to the temperature. Um, and you know they hear this probably more than anyone. And they said, let's use these modern data standards, these modern APIs and the need for transparency and accountability and see what we can do there. I mean, that's the simple, plain English of what the rule is. Now, of course, when you get to the Federal Register and notice of public rulemaking, you know, things balloon into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. <laughs> um, so, but that's the background. So what are the pieces? I, I think for the audience, there are really three pieces to think about here. Um, one are the access APIs, right? Uh, these are payer mandates for transparency. So, um, Folks in this audience probably already know about the patient API. So it's not just the ONC Cures Act API that's required of the EHR, but CMS, uh, you know, CMA Verma put in a requirement for payers. And so that was 2020 and the patient access API for that payers have to provide. So all of the claims data that has been extended it was sort of always extended to payer to payer communication, right? So you change plans. Did your prior plan approve something, that type of continuity of care? What has happened now, but it was never really computable. Now, it, these are all standards-based things. And probably the biggest one in the moderate to near term of these access API is going to be the provider one. So your provider will have, no matter where you got care, will be able to see what the payers have paid for, no matter where you receive that care for the last, um, well, since January of 2016. That's one part of the rule. Okay. The second part of the rule is not of necessity a computable thing, right? So there are two parts that are computable and APIs, um, and we'll leave a teaser for the third part for one minute. Um, but the second part, let's say the sandwich in between, is just raw, no matter how you do it, computers, faxes, accountability for prior auth decision making. Um, and the federal government says if you're a federally controlled plan, so Medicare Advantage, um, first and foremost, Medicaid, uh, you know, the CHIP plans, which are basically Medicaid for kids, the qualified health plans under the exchange, they have slightly different rules to be absolutely specific, but you have to do expedited decisions within 72 hours and standard decisions within seven days. So for the first time at the federal level, Congress tried to pass a law, got through the House, sort of died in the Senate. Um, but for the first time, there's federal rulemaking on a broad swath of plans that there's performance on prior off. Now, that doesn't say, unlike state laws, what commercial plans do, but a lot of them, you know, are running, uh, you know, MA plan and commercial. And it doesn't per se say what the Medicare fee for service does, but that they said will be, you know, essentially run on the same principles. So all of a sudden, we have these requirements. And of course, to have teeth in the requirements, no matter how you do it, facts, you know, uh, paper airplane, no matter how you communicate uh, these things, you know, painful portal for your providers, you're gonna have to report 
and there are a number of features, but they basically come down to how many did you approve? How many did you deny? How long did it take you to approve? How long did it take you to deny, both for the expedited and the standard things? Now, there is an interesting little thing that I suspect, knowing DC, will have some Machiavellian implications, which is that you can aggregate this data, right? So you might deny all kinds of super expensive stuff, approve some things that are not that expensive and have some pretty nice numbers. But, um, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Not that anybody would be Machiavellian. Yeah, that's interesting to see. And I don't think the paper airplanes HIPAA compliant, but maybe uh, if you did it the right way. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the big homing pigeon might be, but <laughs> you you would be surprised. Um, and then the third part, we're going back to APIs now, and this is in the rough order of what's in the rule and sort of conceptually, is in addition to the access API. So just to be clear, that's the payer to patient API, the payer to provider API, and the payer to payer APIs, and and CMS is lumping them as access APIs. There is also now a prior authorization API. So instead of this all being faxorama, which is still the predominant mode yeah, of prior auth in the country, most. or the payer as a provider forcing you to use their portal or portals with each payer having a different portal. Um, and you know, how are you gonna remember that? Um, and of course for the public and, and the docs and hospitals, huge burden. Um, I was on a conference call and one academic health system, which will go unnamed, a one hospital health system had 150 employees doing prior off, <laughs> right? Um, and every practice, AMAs had all kinds of stats on, you know, 40 hours of prior auth work per doctor. Um, so depending on how you slice that. So to start making all of this transparent, computable, fast, lower cost, that's the point of the prior authorization API set. And that's an interesting one, technically, unlike the access APIs, which I think are reasonably well-defined. There's still work to be done in some of the data standards. The um, prior auth one is a little bit, shall we say, underspecified. So um, the goal is really what the Da Vinci, so one of the Fire HL7 accelerators are working on, which is a joint um, payer, provider, uh, public standards group, totally open meetings, part of HL7, which manages the fire data standard. So that's a totally open, um, a really, you know, world-class standards organization. Um, they don't run TEFCA, I might say, and parathetically. Um, <laughs> the, um, so Da Vinci has sort of divided the prior auth world into sort of three pieces. Um, sort of reminds me of the first line in uh, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Gaul is divided into three pieces. <laughs> um, so the first piece is coverage requirements determination, which basically nets out to is prior auth required for this you know, CPT code. The second piece, which I think is technically quite complicated, is this documentation template requirement, which is how do we think about what the actual data fields are that are required um, and are those computable? And that's a really raises a whole bunch of thorny computer science issues. And the third one is just how do we communicate the decisions back and forth? That's the PAS, prior authorization services component. Because especially that second one is, is really a work in progress, um, the what CMS said is let's for now have this prior auth specification. So do January 1st, 2027, um, as with the access API. So there are parts of the rule that need to be done earlier. Um, let's just say you digitally have to be able to say whether something is under prior auth. You have to at least specify electronically, digitally, and I'm assuming that doesn't mean fax, um, what the requirements documents are, and then you have to electronically give the um, decision. 
um, you know, approve, deny, reason for denial, that type of stuff. Um, so to summarize all of it, overall emphasis on transparency, overall emphasis on making healthcare um, and especially prior auth more computable and three pieces to that. One is that center performance, 72 hour, seven day requirement on performance, no matter how many computers or no computers. And then doubling down on the access APIs to get all of the data flowing. And that also, by the way, has the last year's of prior auth decisions in it. Um, we can talk about that more. Um, and then the prior auth API itself. So that's the high level of the rule. I love it. That was very educational. Do you think that that rule and everything that's involved, right, that you just described, is going to actually get us closer to interoperability or, or more importantly, maybe addressing the prior auth challenge and so that they don't have 150 people, they have 50 people or what? Right. Yeah, is it yeah. going to address the problem, really? Yeah. How do you see it? Um, well, first of all, um, I would give huge kudos to the CMS Office of Burden Reduction Group that that wrote this rule. Um, I think, and you know, I've seen good rules, I've seen bad rules. Um, I think they did a masterful job at balancing the here and now with what the public really wants and needs. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they just need a shout out to to that to that group. Um, in the Office of Burden Reduction, I think Alex Muggy was the lead, but, you know, Lorraine Dew and Shannon, there are a bunch of people, uh, Stacey, there are a bunch of people who've been involved in this, yeah, you know, Mary work. Green before she retired. Um, so kudos to them for this. The, I, I think it absolutely has a couple forcing functions. So one, these APIs, you, you know, you have to have them. It puts the data in fire. It makes it computable. Um we know, I mean, CMS just a couple of weeks ago put out an RFI on more Medicare Advantage transparency measures. So don't think of this as, you know, the final rule. <laughs> this is just one step on the way. All of these things are going to be doubled down on. There are a number of people, you know, well-known people, um, you know, Donald Berwick, um, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, David Blumenthal, who've written um, exhaustive pieces on that were probably overpaying by quite a bit for Medicare Advantage. You know, CMS policy people read this stuff too. Sure. Um, and so, and they even mentioned that in the RFI, you know, in the press release RFI. So I think we're going to see more and more accountability. And because what sort of is is something for your audience to think about, historically, certainly on the payer side, we've never really had clinical data, right? Mm -hmm. We've had CPT codes, we've had ICD, you know, eight, nine, ten, depending on where you got on the on the train. Um, maybe some there were some earlier ones, I'm guessing, since there were something before eight, I'm guessing. Um, all right, I think it actually goes back a hundred years, but neither here nor there, they, the payer universe has only had scant pieces of clinical data, right? Show me the lab result. Uh, give me the reason for the, why you're doing surgery. They have not had a holistic view of the patient. And this has been something that, you know, CMS has identified, um, NCVHS that does vital health statistics out of CDC, um, you know, Weedy, all of these groups have identified this. Um, and so now with FIRE, you finally have a way to put all this together. So um, all of that, the rule just accelerates to your question of, you know, what, what are the, you know, the, the accelerate, accelerators, accelerants, I guess, depending on how you define it here. Interesting. And I, I think the other point that's interesting for me is that enforcement is not until January 2027, if I understand it right. So are people just going to wait to implement? Can, can they wait to implement? Or, or talk to us about that, you know, as far as what you see, you know, how you see it yeah. playing out and the impact of waiting if they do choose to wait. Uh, right. You know, how, how do you see that playing out timeline wise? Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a cat and mouse game. 
um, yeah. between federal rule writers and dates. Um, you know, some federal politicals love to put like dates that are like tomorrow and then wait for the outcry and see what sticks. And then move out Others <laughs> um, say, you know, let's give people plenty of time and minimize the disruption and the commotion, right? Because if people are unhappy, um, they go to, to the Hill and complain about it, and then Congress does something about it. So, you know, there's some interesting date dynamics just, you know, for the audience to put yourself in the shoe of a federal rule writer. There's some real calculations, and I assure you, every date is calculated. They didn't <laughs> just come up. They didn't just come up with something. This is an elaborate pirouette. Uh, I'm probably butchering the the ballet of it since I don't know anything about ballet, but it's um, a <laughs> yeah, it's something one of those things. Um, it's it's an elaborate set of constructs around that. Um, I think. Some rules obviously have sort of a fairly light touch. I would say, for example, the ONC cures rule we did really ultimately required an API where you converted the US core data fields into fire. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately front end to a database, like an ODBC driver for folks who sort of have played in SQL. Um, yep. That's not that heavy a lift when you get from a computer science point of view. If you're converting for example, all your prior auth decisions, all of your claims decisions. Now you've already had to convert the claims for the patient access APIs. So the access APIs are just a little bit of an add-on. That's something, if you wait until the very end, not only aren't you gonna have enough time, but more importantly, other people know that that data is highly computable and are gonna get a competitive advantage over you, mm -hmm. right? And where it went up actually, having some early discussions, there are a couple large employers who are so unhappy with their plans. They want to use bulk fire to get the data, which they have an ERISA right to, to see what's going on with the plan, right? So there are all kinds of forcing functions. It's not just this rule. You know, it's going to be risk management in MA. It's going to be um, all of the reporting there. So this is a much bigger and a much more fundamental lift. So I don't think this is sort of like your, you know, high school or maybe college homework. Oh, it's due tomorrow. I better get started. <laughs> um, I think this has a different flavor. And of course, some of the big payers are already realizing there's a long lead time. So you saw, for example, United and Cigna and Humana have all already, at least on some level, pulled back on what they're running through prior auth in advance of the rule. They didn't even wait for the rule, right? Let alone whatever the rule date is. They're saying, hey, we have to clean this up. So they're giving themselves even more lead time. There are some specific things you have to do earlier. So the reporting on performance, which I think for a lot of payers is going to require a huge rethink of their prior auth pipeline, right? That 72 hour thing, maybe for some people they have that turnaround time. A lot of folks I think aren't. So they're going to have to think um, long and hard about how do I re-engineer? This is not a trivial thing, right? It, it, you know, turn around, cycle time is not a trivial thing. You can't bolt on cycle time. That's deep, deep. So they're going to have to think long and hard about cycle time and data. Um, so I think that's, and they actually have to collect those stats starting January 1st of next year because they have to report on the 2025 performance on March 31st, 2026. So for all of that, the, um, you know, now the, the, the reporting date is not, actually, I can't remember if it's 26 or 27. I'll have to look that up. But um, the, um, I'll have to look that up. But that, so you're, you're going to have to, figure this out sooner. You're also going to have to report on use of patient access API, right? So you're going to have to think there about if you're a payer, how are we getting patients to look at their data? This will almost certainly end up sooner or later as, you know, part of STARS rating, right? Engagement, you know, it'll be the next generation of engagement things. And um, as you probably had guests on, you know, star ratings are a big deal in the land of MA plans, yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, it's like Christmas if you, uh, 
you know, observe Christmas for a child. Right. <laughs> I've heard. And well, it can be a, good get a lot of colds on Christmas, depending on what your rating is. Right? Yeah, yeah. So they're, they they often get the coal, <laughs> the proverbial uh, coal and not the candy. Um, so, um, yeah, so there are forcing functions to have this stuff be a lot earlier. Well, and that's what's interesting, you know. Uh, some some doctors, uh, cynical doctors, of course, not like you. You're not cynical at all, I'm sure. But some cynical doctors I've heard say, "Well, they're just trying to screw us over with prior auth, right? Like, and 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 that's why they don't want to automate this. That's why they make us jump through these hoops." And then you talk to the payers, and the payers are like, "No, we just have bad systems." That, that that's I think you know many that I hear you know, and they're like, if we had better systems, we would happily do it quicker. We spend a lot of money on prior auth, you know? So, I mean, to me, if that's the case, then they should do it sooner than later. They have to do it anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, um, obviously the public dialogue is fed by votes and number of voices. There are far more patients and far, you know, and a lot more doctors than there are health insurers. Yeah. Right. So that's why 20 states, you know, apparently have prior auth laws they've passed. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's a lot there are a lot of behaviors in healthcare, some of which are pretty gamey, some of which are probably not even like vaguely ethical. Um, and you know, and then there's most people who do an honest job practicing, but you know, you sort of have to catch all of that. And um, it was never really anticipated that, you know, that payers would have this increasingly central role in managing the provision of care, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, you know, when the original um, 1942 Stabilization Act that made health insurance pre-tax, right? The, the sort of the root of all evil, probably. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were almost no services available in the American healthcare system, right? I mean, there was no endoscopy, you know, imaging was chest x-ray, upper GI. Um, I didn't even know if IVP was available, barium enema, right? No CT, no ultrasound, no MR, no PET, no nothing, right? Surgery was, well, they had anesthesia, um, but, you know, I mean, all these things that, have since come weren't anticipated. And so people were thinking, even in 65 with the onset of CMS and Medicare, they were thinking of insurers as insuring unpredictable, very rare risks. The American health insurance system is not an insurance system. Um, it's a care allocation system. And um, when you look at it that way, uh, then, you know, prior off is a tool that payers sort of have to use, right? Yeah. So I think your framing is spot on. There's, you know, things to be said, uh, you know, there's large swaths of truth on both sides. It's just, you know, once you actually sit in the kitchen and do the recipe, maybe, you know, and stick it in the oven, maybe things didn't come out quite right. Yeah. Well, and maybe there's challenges on both sides. Hopefully, yeah. oh, this yeah. transparency will will highlight that and uh, help us understand. Yeah, that. I mean, look, we're also fundamentally, um, you know, for other payment history, have boxed ourselves boxed ourselves in that the systems of record, the enterprise software as providers, evolved as documentation systems rather than automation systems. Right? What industry that you are aware of outside of healthcare uses computers? and doesn't do automation. Mm. That's a right? good way to describe it, a documentation I mean, versus it's, it, automation it, system. You know, we make more work for ourselves. Like what, you'd be fired as a CIO in any other industry. In healthcare, oh, we get uh, a higher CPT code. Yeah, you can document more. Okay, we'll pay you more for the documentation. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fundamentally, it's fundamentally, uh, well, upside down. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Well, let's shift gears to to your favorite topic, <laughs> Since slightly facetiously. Uh, you know, Tefka and QHINS. What is your perspective on, on QHINS officially starting to share data? Yeah. We we know at least some data has been shared. I haven't seen the latest numbers. You know, what are we yeah. a few months later? So, 
<laughs> for folks, uh, you know, who may not know, I've had a couple public comments about Tefka. Um, always a delicate thing. So Tefka, whatever that is or is meant to be, was required in the Cures Act. Um, uh, what was also required in the next provision is that, that CMS put out provider directories, which hasn't happened and would obviate Tefka in large part. So you know, when that happens, um, my real beef with Tefka fundamentally is what does it take to get to a modern digital economy in healthcare, right? What do we need as the American public, as patients, so that all these great computers, smartphones, devices, every single tech under the sun, um, that we can use that. And that requires modern data, modern APIs, um, and Tefka is fundamentally anchored on 1990s sort of technologies which are document exchange and sort of a brittle the IHE protocol for that part of your audience that was um you know awake alive and sentient in 1997 right all the internet was were web pages right it was like a really 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 big thing that you could buy a book through this site called Amazon and you would put in a credit card and maybe somebody would steal it and right. So, you know, we can do better 25 years plus years later. Um, so that's the fundamental beef. Um, and, you know, it's not computable. It's not, you know, it's not real. You get this big document, CCDA, you know, CCD type of thing. And then you have to parse it apart. None of this is real time. None of this powers a consumer experience. Would you wait 60 seconds for any transaction and every transaction on your smartphone, let alone hours? I think not, right? No, right? So so that's the real rub with Tefka. You know, then you get into the details. Obviously, I've been somewhat embarrassed because the original Tefka um, didn't have anything on fire in the modern data standard, which, you know, was in large part funded by ONC and supported. So that was sort of honestly a little bit of an embarrassment. So now they're scrambling to fire eyes. I don't think that's either a noun or a verb, but we'll, <laughs> we'll make it. I don't know what that yeah, is. What do you think about that? Because they have announced on the roadmap for yeah. to support fire, you know, how, uh, are, you, you know, is it, too late? Is it a good effort? Now, you know, what do you see there? <laughs> yeah, you know, there there are a couple answers, you know, ranging from the snarky to the deeply technical. Um, I think that sort of the more technical answer is what makes JSON, which is the data representation of fire. JSON is essentially all of the backend traffic on your phone, right? Every app on your phone, it talks with servers. Right, there'd be no business model for these apps. So all of the apps are flyweight little things that talk with servers. And that data back and forth that paints the screen is JSON and the RESTful APIs. Like literally just about every single thing in some version on your phone. Mm -hmm. So the assumption that you can take Fire, aka JSON, but then use a 25-year-old data stand, a API standard, that's not innately a accurate type of thing. Now, you could sort of say a bunch of stuff about that, but realistically, um, if without RESTful APIs or something very similar to that, and there are some variants, um, you're not really having modern computing. So um, you can sort of, quote, fire it, um, but, and so what you see in the proposed rule, of course, is they're just mightily struggling for that. So the first phase they proposed has the data fields to be exchanged or done out of bandwidth. Out of bandwidth means we can't use the API to figure out what to exchange. So send us a fax and then we'll use the API. You know, jokingly, I was quoted once as saying, yeah, we'll use carrier pigeons you know, and you'll tie the fire fields you want and there'll be a carrier pigeon going to each hospital and, you know, send me these things. Now, obviously that's sort of, you know, funky, but the concept that you have an API where you can't ask what you want 
is, I mean, that's sort of beyond odd. Mm -hmm. So the next two phases <clears throat> that they have is brokered fire and facilitated fire, um, you know, <laughs> somewhat Orwellian, um, are things like, well, maybe we'll use the network or maybe we'll use security layers. Um, and, you know, so the brokers will have a chance to sell something to you. Um, frankly, I'm not actually sure why as a country we need these brokers to, you know, delay competition and delay real to and pre effectively prevent real time access, you know, for apps. Um, CMS is required in the very next section of the Cures Act to have a national provider directory. And I think they're doing that. They've had an R5 that was submitted. Um, at that point, you don't need to be managing these, you know, collections of bespoke proprietary endpoint collections. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other nuances there. Um, the, the other issue with Tefka that I think has increasingly come out is that they don't really use, and I'm sure they would disagree. And so you can go to, you know, sequoia.org and see what they say, you know, for the audience. Um, but they're not really using sort of modern public key cryptography, right? When you go and you do anything with your bank account or HTTPS or, you know, whatever, you're using various secure protocols. They're relying disproportionately on contractual operating procedures. Well, yeah. There'll be a bad actor. There's always a bad actor, right? So, I mean, just a big case that I don't think they've handled is the whole business with um, reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. So without getting into pro-choice right to life or wherever you are on that whole, on that whole, you know, spectrum, just from an IT point of view, um, Tefka doesn't have a mechanism that I'm aware of to say you're in this state, but don't let QHINs that go to other states use this, right? They don't have a QHIN per state, right? They don't have a way to segregate any of that kind of stuff. I think that's a example or an example, I guess, more accurately grammatically, but um, I, I just don't think they really have a robust security model. Um, and you know, to reinvent a security model even if it's only a partial reinvention, um, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> you know, we've had some really, really smart people sort through public key cryptography and certificates and certificate authorities. Um, you, you know, we should leverage off a of strength and have stuff that's plausible to be real time and allow new apps, new competitors. It shouldn't just be oligopoly delivery systems you know, with their vendor, you know, running a QHIN as the, um, you know, backbone of this. Well, probably enough said there. <laughs> that's what I'm interested to see is how do they turn this into a business model or, you know, yeah, and that's also, whole... does that enable or disable or yeah. you know, deter interoperability? Well, obviously, you know, some of the people have other business models. So, yeah. They don't need you know, it. you can look at this and they might do the it anyway. Clayton Antitrust <laughs> Act. It's called a tie-in, um, which has a lot of case law around it, going back 100 and, over 100 years to the trusts. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the other people, you know, will say, I mean, you know, they're smart folks. Um, you know, a lot of those folks are good folks. You know, they'll, I'm sure, come up with like value-add services and things. I mean, they're, you know, they're going to, they're going to come up with stuff that gets, and, you know, Tefkis, you know, I think there's some use cases where it's perfectly fine. Um, Social Security Administration doing a disability determination, right, where they need all your medical records. Tefka's perfect for that, right? So there are some use cases where this kind of document approach that, right, Social Security is not going to decide whether you're disabled in real time, right? <laughs> And of course yeah. they shouldn't since, you know, that we're paying for that, um, right? They're going to take their time. It takes weeks and weeks and weeks once they even have the data to make those determinations. Tefka's perfect for that. That's great. Yeah, and I think that's where it will be interesting is where will yeah. it actually be used? 
how will it actually be used? Yeah. Where is it providing yeah. value? Yeah. So talking more broadly, I mean, you, you've obviously seen a lot happening with interoperability. You know, if, I, if I'm a CIO or, you know, even, you know, CMIO, whatever, at a healthcare organization right now, I'd probably be looking at it and saying, man, what should I do? <laughs> so what do you think right. the organization should know and be doing when it comes to interoperability of health data? And what should they kind of maybe not be distracted by shiny objects? I don't know how shiny they are, but yeah. <laughs> what, what should, yeah. how should they be approaching interoperability? Is it just my EHR is doing it or should I be in a network? Hey, what, yeah. what do you think? <laughs> um, I think I've always believed for many decades that the real core of interoperability is not to exchange some snippet of a lab result or a note, right? Um, the real point of this is to compute, right? I mean, the real point is how do we provide intelligent, real-time, ongoing better care for ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Not just at the doctor's visit, you know, oh yeah, you know, here, change this blood pressure medicine. We'll see you in six months and, you know, check your kidney and your blood sugar and, right? That kind of episodic care is, is on some level ludicrous, right? The plaque in your coronary arteries isn't waiting six months to grow, right? The weakness in your carotid isn't waiting six months for the next blood pressure medicine change, right? I mean, the, the whole model of care is sort of goofy from the get-go. So how do we have continuous real-time computing? You know, in the past, we couldn't have that. Um, but, you know, now we're at the, at the cusp of having that. And that will, one way or the other, make it to providers, right? It'll be policy things. It'll be economic things. It'll be competitors. Do you think Jeff Bezos knows that? I'm pretty sure he does. Do you think Walmart knows that? I'm pretty sure they do, right? Do you think the folks at CVS know that? I'm pretty sure, right? So we're in this battle where the consumer companies are going to butt heads with the you know, provider incumbents. Mm -hmm. And it's no different than, you know, newspapers and the digital mm -hmm. internet. It's no different than travel agents and airline apps or travel velocity. It's no different than, you know, malls and online shopping, right? I mean, it's just no different. It just takes longer, it's healthcare, it's more circuitous. So if you're a CIO, I think you sort of have to think in the back of your head, how am I going to have my value proposition computable, fully and deeply computable, right? Value is what am I delivering and what am I charging? Or on the payer side, what was the service offered and what was what were what am what costs am I fronting for the people who are paying for it, whether it's companies, patients, taxpayers, or all of the above? And obviously now with fire, you have the ability to get claims and clinical into one thing. And you whether you use that for classic analytics or a tableau thing or a large language model or you know, generative AI or whatever, I think. If you're a CIO on either side of that payer provider thing, and this is in essence what you're seeing with CMS, right? I mean, the rule is there, there take one on this or take two more accurately. Um, it is, you have to figure out how am I gonna get computable, computable clinical thing. And if you think you're doing it in your EHR or your claims processing engine, um, I would submit your mistake. <laughs> I just leave it at that. That's right? a change of mindset though, right? If I mean, you, it's, a, it's a big change of mindset. <laughs> yeah, hey. And, you know, that's what winners do. Um, and, you know, and others don't, right? Yep. And, I mean, we, anybody who's an adult now in our adult lifetime has lived through so many examples of digital disintermediation that... It's not like it's a complicated or a rare thing. We're not living in 1810 and wondering, you know, what the spinning Jenny or the steam engine is going to do, even though those people, you know, they sort of knew exactly. Um, you know, we're living where everyone 
has that dense intermediation, they touch it a million times a day. I mean, think of the number of restful API calls you as a human being in America with a cell phone have made on your cell phone today that you don't even know about, right? Just background, right? You got an alert, you got a message, you got this, you looked at that, you know, a thousand million calls to do every little snippet. Um, and so I think as a CIO, and you know, the first, again, this is not a new insight, right? So the first step in this journey, which really was taken, I would say for the most part, roughly 20 odd years ago with the onset of relational databases, I mean, people used hierarchical databases before, mumps, right? Um, cache type of stuff. Um, but with the onset of relational databases, um, people realized, oh, I should have an enterprise data warehouse. The problem with the enterprise data warehouse, so the relational model, which of course is mathematically brilliant, is it um, doesn't really allow you to seamlessly compute. If you want to do computing on your data, you know, it's it's a slog. You're writing queries, you're, you know, taking the query, you're doing complex stuff, you're moving it somewhere, you're doing some more analytics. So there's a lot of shuffling of data. I mean, what makes cloud is not just that you can store data in the cloud, you know, sort of like your overstuffed closet. What makes the cloud compelling is you can compute on it. I mean, just look at any of the cloud vendors' core websites and see how many compute services they offer Yeah. Um, on the same data, right? On the same data store, right? It hasn't, it doesn't need to be, you know, Hmong, moved, whatever. Um, and ask yourself, my competitors, some competitors doing that. I mean, that's what we do at 1UP. Right. There are people who are doing that, who are well funded, you know, who are doing that and ask yourself, um, gee, that's a lot of compute services in this cloud platform. And, yeah, you know, it's the same whether it's AWS or Azure or Google or or probably even Snowflake, um, maybe not there or, or Oracle. Um, so ask yourself, would I need that? Would I want that? Because um, that's really what a modern CIO's real task is. Now, th th what makes it interesting is that's not the way we think in healthcare, right? I mean, we just don't, right? Yep. So anyway. It's a change of mindset. Yeah. Well, Don, this is, it's always entertaining to talk to you. It's always interesting. <laughs> and I always uh, gain a lot of knowledge and insights and uh, I think a unique perspective on a number of issues. So I appreciate you taking time to talk with us and help us learn more about this rule and, and uh, you know, and, and you yeah, know, more to come, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, John. It's always, it's always fun chatting with you. Yep. Thanks so much. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting applications. Thanks, Don.